Hello and welcome to today's video. It's going to be looking at Kaya Chingoni, who is a really accomplished poet and he also wrote Kumakanda, which is now in Edexcel's Belonging Anthology. So that's what we're going to be looking at today. I hope you enjoy. Chingoni was born in Zambia in 1987 and that's also where the story of this poem takes place and it's something that I'll discuss a little bit later in the video. Um, so he was born in Zambia and then he moved to the UK in 1993 at the age of six and that was after his father died and when he was in the UK he lived in Newcastle, London and Essex and unfortunately his mother also died when he was just 13 so clearly he's experienced a lot of loss very early on in his life and in fact in an interview with the Financial Times he was asked who he'd like to sit next to at a dinner party and Chingoni responded with my mother restored to life. Um, Chingoni is passionate about music and like numerous poets he's dabbled in rap as a teenager and you can see the influence of that in some of his other poems. I love this poem and one of the reasons for that is because it was my first time hearing about the ritual called Kumakanda and I had never heard of it before and so it made me quite inquisitive about what it involved. So Kumakanda is, it means initiation and it's a rite of passage for the young Livale boys in northwestern Zambia and essentially they're expected to cross a river to remove their childish estate, as he puts it, to come back as grown men. And Chingoni says that he first heard about the Kumakanda in conversations with an aunt and he said that it opened up a space in his work to write about this feeling of loss. And loss is definitely something that's explored in this poem. He comments on the loss of family members, his childhood and identity. His approach to poetry is an interesting one. He states, I resist the idea that the poems are my story in any authoritative way. The act of creativity is to ask how I can move beyond that into sharing with someone a text or a poem that encourages them to reflect on certain things in their own life. So from this, we can judge that he's keen for the reader to read his poetry, but make it their own. So although I might offer my own observations and interpretations of this poem, I really encourage you to consider it for yourself and maybe put some ideas that you have into the comments. It'll be interesting to see what you have to say about it too. So without further ado, here is Kaya Chingoni reading Kumakanda, which was published in 2017. Kumakanda. Since I haven't danced among my fellow initiates, following a looped procession from woods at the edge of a village, Tata's people would think me unfinished, a child who never sloughed off the childish estate, crossing the river boys of our tribe must cross in order to die and come back grown. I was raised in a strange land by small increments. When I bathed my mother the days she was too weak. When auntie broke the news and I chose a yellow suit and white shoes to dress my mother's body. At the graveside, when a man I almost grew to call dad, though we both needed a hug, shook my hand. If the alternate self that never left could see me, what would he make of these literary pretensions, this need to speak with a tongue that does not belong to me? Would I recognize him, or would he be strange to me as me to him, frowning as he speaks to me in the language of my father and my father's father? and my father's father's father. This is a free verse poem, so that means there's no rigid poetic structure. However, it has been organised into three six-line stanzas, and each stanza seems to relate to different stages in his life. So for instance, stanza one looks at Chingoni's childhood in Zambia, stanza two explores his growth in the UK, and finally stanza three shows us his current self, where he's questioning the what-ifs of his life. Let's look at stanza one to start. There's a lot of unjamment in this poem as a whole, and that creates a sense of continuous thought, like he's really mulling over this. 
But there's also the idea of movement, and given the poet's history of moving around, it does make sense that he's going to use enjambment to reflect the movement that he himself took on. So for instance, he writes about how the other initiates follow a loot procession from woods at the edge of a village, and this run online mimics their procession. Um, he also uses I quite a lot, and this personal pronoun makes the poem quite intimate because it lets us see his insecurities. So, for example, in the first stanza, he mentions that he's anxious about being perceived as unfinished by his biological dad's people, who he refers to as Tata. And then he returns to this idea of questioning himself when he asks if his alternate self, the one who would have stayed in Zambia, would frown at him for speaking and writing poetry in English. Chingoni says that not taking part in the Kumakanda, which he would have done if he had stayed in Zambia, made him pay more attention to the small things that had made him grow up across the threshold into the adult world. So instead of growing up by crossing a river, like he would have if he was in Zambia, he matured in small increments, and those small increments are explored in stanza 2. Chingoni refers to the UK as a strange land, and the adjective strange immediately positions him as being vulnerable and uncomfortable, and this is magnified when we realise the tragedies that he has to confront, such as bathing his mother because she becomes too ill. And this role reversal, where the child has to care for the parent, would inevitably make someone more mature. He then goes on to tell us about when his auntie broke the news, and he doesn't explicitly say his mother died, but we can infer it based on the previous and the following line, but by not referring to it specifically, it conveys that it's still quite a sensitive subject for him, and specifically the word the, that definitive article, it shows that it's a really monumental and pivotal change, it's the moment, the news that he's learnt. Auntie is quite a conflicting word in my eyes. It's got a softness to it and a sense of familiarity, like we all know who Auntie is. However, when we add in the reference to the man that Chingoni almost grew to call Dad, it feels quite isolated and it feels like the adults around him never show him the affection that we would assume he needs as a grieving child. And this is further enforced by the fact that as a child, he was expected to choose his mother's burial clothes and I'm not sure if this is a cultural t tradition or something like that, but it's very clear to see that this is going to be a really monumental moment in a child's life. I tried researching clothes that deceased people wear in the Valley funerals, but I couldn't find anything concrete, so please let me know if I'm wrong with my next point. But we might assume that selecting bright clothes for his mother's funeral is quite unconventional. Um, so Chingoni says that he dressed his mother in a yellow suit and white shoes, um, I feel like there's two potential reasons that this might be the case. So firstly, it might be because he's never had to bury anyone before and deal with funeral arrangements before. So there's quite a childish innocence in using such conventionally happy colours um, at such an unhappy occasion. But alternatively, it might just be because that's the most comforting and easiest thing for him. He can remember his mother being full of life, wearing bright colours. He's trying to recreate her as he remembers her. Chingoni utilises Anjaman again in the stanza when he talks about standing at the graveside with the man that he almost grew to call dad, and the line break between call and dad creates more distance between them, and it's particularly interesting when we contrast it against the word tata in the first stanza. So by using the intimate register and having this almost like a pet name to refer to his biological dad, we can see how close their relationship was. And that's vastly different from his relationship with his would-have-been stepfather. So his would-have-been stepfather chooses to shake his hand like a man instead of hugging him. And that raises a few questions. So we can't help but wonder, did that near dad shake his hand because he was uncomfortable? Did he shake his hand because he genuinely thought that Chingoni was grown up and that it was inappropriate to hug him? Um, and then the poet also adds that they both needed a hug. So is there an element there of, a discussion of masculinity and the need to try to man up but not show emotions. And when we talk about masculinity in this poem, the initiation, the Kumakanda initiation itself is about becoming a man. So it makes sense that there is this kind of element questioning um, how people interact with one another. And the fact that Chingoni repeats the word father six times in just six, if not 16, 15 lines. 
the final stanza really highlights the conflict between Chingoni and his lineage. He uses rhetorical questions and wonders how his alternate self would respond upon hearing him speak another language, English, and writing poetry or engaging in literary pretensions. And the word pretension kind of refers to a sense of posing or artifice, and that seems to imply that Chingoni is either self-conscious that that's how he would be perceived, or that he's not fully comfortable in his role as a poet. And both ideas have merit because he says his alternate self would frown, but he also says that he has a need to speak with a tongue that isn't his, so it's not natural to him. The poem's kind of gone full circle here because it started off with him talking about following a procession of boys who were walking in the woods, and then it ends with him reflecting on the procession of men that came before him. So his father, his father's father, and his father's father's father. So in being able to reflect on his Zambian roots, we see that they've never truly left him. They're built within him and they're at the core of his being. This is such a beautiful poem and one that I think a lot of people can relate to because it's got a lot of rich thematic links to youth, culture, masculinity, family, loss, and it very much is one of my favourites in the anthology. So I hope you liked it as well. Um, thank you for listening and I'll see you next time.